Hello everybody and welcome back once again. My name is Jordan, also known as JMonster, and you're watching episode 3 of Caesar in Gaul. And this time around, we're going to be talking about Caesar's conflict with the German tribes led by Ariovistus that came over the Rhine into Gaul and caused all kinds of problems, which you will see very shortly. Now, on the conclusion of Caesar's cam victorious campaign against the Helvetii, the leading men from all of the tribes all over Gaul came together to offer Caesar congratulations for his great victory. And they said that they realized, although his motive in fighting the Helvetii was to punish them for their past injuries, for their past injuries to Rome, what had happened was just as much to the advantage of the Gauls as of the Romans. So, for because the Helvetii were apparently uh, intending to take over all of Gaul, uh, which is why they abandoned their their homeland at a time when they were enjoying quite a lot of prosperity. So, these uh, deputies asked Caesar to let them fix a day for convening all the tribes all over Gaul into a pan-Gallic assembly, saying they told Caesar that they were s there were certain requests that they would like to submit to him when uh, all of them had agreed about them. Now, with Caesar's consent, they appointed a date for this assembly and swore to one another not to disclose his proceedings without its express authority. Now, the after the assembly had met and concluded its business, the same chieftains who had been with Caesar before, who were led by, I believe, Diwiacus, the Aeduan, the Aeduan kind of puppet king, uh, asked Leif to interview him privately in a place secluded from observation so that they could discuss the proceedings of the assembly that they had just resolved not to discuss with anybody. Anyway. Um, so, they explained that they were very anxious to prevent what they said from being disclosed. This was just as important to them as obtaining the requests that they had come to make to Caesar originally, because disclosure, the disclosure of what, had, what was going on would bring the most cruel punishment upon them, probably from their kinsfolk for being traitorous bastards. <laughs> anyway, the Gauls, he said, were divided into two parties. There is the one dominated by the Aedui, traditional allies of Rome, and the Arverni, who are the tribe of uh, Versingetorix, or Versingetorix. I suppose it, or Wersingetorix probably be closer to how it would be pronounced in Latin of the time. And uh, after a fierce struggle for supremacy lasting many years, the Arverni and the Sequani, who made up part of, uh, you remember the Sequani for letting the uh, Helvetia pass through their lands, they hired some German mercenaries. And yes, these are, this is the faction hostile to Rome to help them uh, beat back their, their brethren and win supremacy in Gaul. And at first, about 15,000 of, of these German mercenaries crossed the Rhine, but when these, when the uh, German tribes had kind of acquired a taste for living in Gaul, they decided that hmm, they want to stay, so they kept bringing more and more of their friends over. And at the time that uh, they were submitting these requests to Caesar, there was probably about 120,000 of them in the country, which is significant. That's a lot. And the IW and their satellite tribes had fought with the Germans on many uh, prior occasions that had suffered disastrous defeats, oh dear, by which they had lost all their noblest citizens, counselors, and knighthood, which would pretty much break their the back of their power base, which is what it did. And so they are coming to the Romans once again to prop them up. Although I'm, I'm sure they didn't say that. Anyway. And the Sequani, unfortunately suffered a much worse fate than this. I mean, the Aeduians had their, their power and prestige broken, and they had to submit hostages for their good behavior and promised that they would never go to Rome to ask for for uh, assistance. But the Sequani ended up having about a third of their land annexed by this point, and Ariovistus, who was apparently turned out to be a bit of a tyrant, is bidding them to evacuate another third of their lands, which is apparent, apparently the best in all of Gaul. So, they're being slowly supplanted and driven out of their home, so kind of sucks for them. And at the same time, uh, there is another 24,000 men of the Harudis who are crossing the river, which is actually why he's having them evacuate another third of their, of their uh, property, so that he can settle his friends in that area. And in a few years' time, the whole popul this is what they say, in a few years' time, the whole population of Gaul would be expatriated and all the Germans would migrate across the Rhine. And there would be no compare because there was no comparison between the soil of Germany and that of Gaul. And, uh, you know, you know, or between their respective standards of living. 
So after a single victory over the United Gallic forces at Admaghetto Briga, Aurovistius basically, yeah, he's got Gaul exactly where he wants them. Now, Ariovistus is somebody who, at this point in time, has the title of Friend of the Senate and Roman People. So that's a big deal. That confers him certain privileges and protections, and he's favored by the uh, by the Senate and, and the people of Rome. So, when uh, when Diviacus, who is giving this, who's laying down the, this speech to... to Caesar finishes what he was saying. The whole deputation began with many tears to employ, implore Caesar's aid. He noticed, however, that the Sequanian representatives did not follow the example of the rest, but hung their heads in dejection with their eyes fixed on the ground. In astonishment, he asked them the reason for this behavior. But without making any reply, they maintained their attitude of silent dejection. After which, he questioned them repeatedly about being able to get a word out of them. Dibiacus spoke again. The lot of the Sequani, he explained was even more grievous than that of the rest. And, uh, they stood in terror of Aroistius' cruelty, even when he was far away, just as they were in his presence. So, for a while, for a, for, for a while, the, uh, the other tribes could flee out of his reach. They are right next to Aroistius. And he has, uh, basically taken, taken, uh, control over pretty much all of their towns. And he can do anything that he wants to them. So, on receiving this information, Caesar reassures the Gaulish deputation and promises to attend to the matter, adding that he had great hopes that the privileges he had secured for Ariovistus, being a friend of the people and Senate of Rome, as well as the weight of his own authority, by which he means his the fact that he kicks everyone's ass, um, would induce Ariovistus to cease his, his oppression of the, of the Gallic tribes that he had concert, conquered. Rather, he then dismissed the the meeting, and uh, in addition to what he had been told uh, by the Gallic representatives, many others convinced him that this problem must this ha is a problem that has to be has to be dealt with. You can't just have the the Germans kind of beating up your friends and not do anything about it. So, Caesar decides to send envoys requiring Ariovistus to uh, select a place for a conference someplace lying between their present positions as he wished to discuss business of the state of the highest importance to both of them. To this delegation, Ariovistus replied, If I wanted anything from Caesar, I should go to him. So if he wants anything from me, he must come to me. Which is kind of a shitty reply. He added that he dared not come without the protection of his army into the part of Gaul occupied by Caesar. And that to concentrate his forces would mean making elaborate troublesome arrangements for provisioning them. He did not imagine what business Caesar or the Romans at all, for that matter, had in the part of Gaul, which was his by right of conquest. So, at this, Caesar sends an embassy to remind Ariovistus of the important privileges conferred upon him, yada yada yada, by the Roman government, which Caesar basically secured for him. These being the titles of king and friend. Since... This way of showing gratitude, since this way of showing gratitude was to refuse an invitation to a conference for the discussion of matters affecting their common interests, the envoys were instructed to deliver to him an ultimatum. First, he was not to bring any more large bodies of men across the Rhine into Gaul. Second, he was to restore the Aeduian hostages he held and authorize the Sequani to restore those whom they had held. Finally, he was not to oppress the Aedui or make war upon them or their allies. On these conditions, Caesar, Caesar, I'm going to switch between the two at my leisure, and the Roman government would maintain cordial relationships or cordial and friendly relations with him. If these demands were refused, then in accordance with the decree of the Senate passed by the in, during the consulship of Mar Marcus Massalis, Massala and Marcus Piso in 61 BC, directing all governors of the province of Gaul to do everything consistent with the public interest to protect the Aedui and the Roman allies, Caesar would not fail to punish his ill treatment of them. So war, basically. In reply, Ariovistus says it was re it was the recognized custom of war for victors to rule the vanquished in any way that they pleased, and that the Romans acted on this principle by governing their conquered subjects, not according to the dictates of any third party, but by their own discretion. Since he did not dictate to them how they were to exercise their rights, he ought not to be interfered with in the exercise of his. It was because the Aedui had tried the it was because the Aedui had tried the fortune of war. Basically, everybody in Gaul had tried this. 
and were losers in this fight that they had to pay him tribute, and Kaisar was doing him a serious injustice by coming to Gaul and causing him a loss of revenue. He would return the hostages to the Aedui, but would refrain but would refrain from making any one or he would not return the hostages to the Aedui, but would refrain from making any wanton attack upon them or their allies. As long as they kept, you know, their end of the bargain and paid him tribute regularly every year. If they did not, titles of Brothers of the Roman People, that being the Aedui, would not save them from the consequences. He says, I am not impressed by Kaisar's threat to punish my, finger quotes, oppression of these people. No one has ever fought me without bringing destruction upon himself. Ugh, famous last words. Yes, and as I, as I say this, we are destroying these, these German tribes here. So this is quite fantastic. Um, but yes, no one has ever fought me without bringing destruction upon himself. Let him attack whenever he pleases. He will discover what German valor is capable of. We have never known defeat. We have superb training in arms. For 14 years, we have never sheltered beneath a roof. At the very moment when this message was being reported to Kaisar, delegations arrived from the Aedui and the Treveri, who, as mentioned earlier, I believe they were mentioned earlier, they, um, they were allies of Rome and they would supply them with uh, contingents of cavalry and that sort of thing. The Treveri, that is. The Aedui came to complain that the Harudes, who had recently been, been brought across the Rhine, about 24,000 of them, were ravaging their territory, and that even the surrender of hostages had failed to induce Ariovistus to leave them in peace. The Treveri stated that a hundred clans of the Suebi had encamped on the bank of the Rhine and were trying to cross under the command of Na Nasua and his brother Kimberius. Kaisar was immediately perturbed by this news, rightly so, I would imagine, and decided because the Suebi are one of the largest and most powerful tribes across the Rhine, so it's, it's a big deal. But, uh,. If this fresh horde of Swebi joined forces with Ariovistus, Ariovistus' veteran troops, it might become more difficult to resist them. Yes, that's true. It may become slightly more difficult. Accordingly, he arranged for a supply of grain, and quickly as he could, advanced at top speed toward Ariovistus. Which is, I think, more... It, it's, it's fairly close, I believe, to, uh, to where we are on the map right now, so that's, that's kind of awesome, isn't it? After three days' march, it was reported that the Germans were hastening, or that the German was hastening with all of his forces to occupy Besançon, which I believe is the modern town in France. The, uh, or city, I'm actually not entirely sure how, what size of, uh, what size of sort of area, village, that uh, Besançon is the largest town of the Sequani. And uh, he had already advanced three days' journey beyond his own frontier. Oh dear. Kaisar felt that he must take energetic measures to prevent the fall of this town, for it contained an abundance of military stores of every kind, and its natural defenses were so strong that it offered every facility to protracting hostilities. Now, there's the river Do Doubs, Doubs, D O U B S, forms an almost complete and perfect circle around uh, the city of Besançon. And the gap left unprotected is little more than about 500 yards wide and is blocked by a high hill. And it's by a high hill so completely that the spurs at its base run right down to the riverbank on either side. Now, this hill is uh, kind of girded by a wall, which gives, gives it the strength of basically a citadel, and joins it with the town, the hill that is. And Kaisar hastened here by forced marshes, continued day and night, which is something that he would do to con very consistently to surprise the crap out of his enemies by how quickly he could move 30,000 men around. And he occupies the town and places a garrison inside of it. And uh, during the few days that they, sp they spend near Besançon to lay in, you know, a stock of corn, which, as someone pointed out to me, corn... It is not actually corn, which is true. Corn is a New World staple. What they're probably referring to here is wheat, grain, that sort of thing. So, his provision of corn and other provisions, the soldiers begin to question the Gauls and the merchants there, who talked about, you know, the enormous stature and military brilliance of the Germans and how super scary they were and all that stuff. Some affirmed that on many occasions, when they had met them in battle, the very expression on their faces and the fierce glance of their eyes were more than they could endure, which sounds, <clears throat> well, you know, you know exactly what that sounds like. That, and that this completely unnerved them. And began, and sort of the dissension within Caesar's ranks begins with the military tribunes, the prefects of the auxiliary troops, and the men with little experience of war who follow Caesar from Rome in order to cultivate his friendship. Not naming any names. <laughs> 
But uh, most of these alleged some urgent reason for leaving camp, you know, make something up, and ask Kaisar's permission to go. Stay out, you know, some stayed out of shame and, an, and a desire to avoid the suspicion of cowardice, and others made up, made up reasons like they were afraid of the corn supply and that sort of thing. You know, so they didn't seem like little, little sissies. And uh, that is where we're going to end it for the for the day. So we have beaten up some Germans, and it was super fun and stuff. But that is the end of episode three. So I will see you in episode four. And I hope you guys enjoyed. We're going to continue with uh, Caesar's attacks against the uh, the Germans and the ultimate defeat of them. So I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you later.